Thank you. I saw that other people were flying to the bathroom just like I was, trying to get a break in. Um, thank you to Kit Dunlap for inviting me here today. Uh, I think this is my third or fourth time speaking to chamber folks about the Affordable Care Act. Um, it's a fun topic, right? Um, so I teach health policy to master's students, and um, I tell my students there's really no greater time in history than to be a student of health policy. Because as we heard, if every day you turn on the news and you're hearing yet one more change that's occurring. And so it's a, it's a pretty nice topic to be involved in. Um, OK, so I, um, I was charged with talking about um, the impacts of the Affordable Care Act on, on employer-based health insurance in particular. But um, I actually wanted to start off with why are we talking about health care reform in the first place? So maybe just take a step backwards. Um, I think when we're having discussions about um, should we defund the Affordable Care Act or should we continue down this um, path, um, I think it's important to remember that um, the status quo of our health care system that we have right now is pretty awful um, in terms of the rising health care costs, in terms of the uh, health outcomes that we're seeing in our population, and in terms of access to health care. And so while I personally may feel that there are some parts of the Affordable Care Act that are just, frankly, bad policy, and we might talk about that in the Q&A section, um, I, um, I'm still an optimist. And I'm an optimist because I understand what the status quo is right now. And so that's what I wanted to start off uh, my presentation with. So uh, I would argue that the status quo is really unsustainable for three reasons. The first reason, and this is weird, but I have paper in front of me, the slides behind me, so I'm going to be doing this a lot, so just bear with me. Um, so I would, I would argue that the first reason why the status quo is unsustainable is that healthcare spending is growing faster than the economy and growing faster than our wages. And while the trend in, this, in our healthcare spending may be leveling off, you may have heard some um, evidence of that in the media in the last year, the, the trends are still um, increasing. So here's just, this is somewhat of an old, um, slide, so the last data point here is 2004, but it's looking at the percent of healthcare care expenditures as a percent of GDP um, in several countries. And you can see there that the top line, the red, is the United States. So the good news is, in comparison to the other developed countries, they all have an increasing trend in how much they're spending on health care, but their slope is a little bit lower than our slope. Um, and I've also added 2010 um, estimates. So in 2004, the percent of GDP on health expenditures was around 16%. And the last figure for which these data are available, um, we're running at 18%. So um, an economist might say, well, maybe 18% is not such a bad thing if it's the case that we, um, we are afforded to better health outcomes relative to our peer countries. Um, and I un unfortunately can't say that that is occurring, right? So the second piece of why we've even talked about reforming our healthcare system is that we have um, health outcomes that, and health status indicators that are really inadequate relative to our peer countries, um, and that these poor health outcomes are driving healthcare costs. So for example, the America's Health Rankings, which, is, um, which uh, produces an annual report on how the states fare in terms of many different health indicators, including health outcomes and health risk behaviors. Um, the last data uh, available is from 2012, and it shows that the, um, Georgia ranks 36 of all of the states in terms of our health outcomes, uh, overall health rankings. And so you can see some of the, um, the, the components that are driving this ranking. We're 27th in obesity prevalence, 33rd in diabetes, um, 36th in health status, and that's people reporting that they're in poor or fair health. And I just want to put in a plug for public health funding in the state of Georgia um, to show that maybe one of the reasons why we're 36th in the country is because the amount of money we put into public health is also pretty low at 37. Um, so this has some pretty severe economic implications of having poor health indicators. Um, these data that I'm presenting are old, again, but um, I think it gets the point across, which is when you look at some of the chronic diseases that we have, 
um, in the diabetes belt that we live in. Um, you can see that the costs for uh, outcomes such as obesity are, we're running around $2.1 billion in 2000, and a good chunk of those costs um, is landing in our, in our public insurance programs, Medicaid and Medicare. And so while we may uh, be afforded private health insurance as individuals, if we're lucky, um, it's these public insurance programs that we should also care about as taxpayers, because we do pick up the burden um, in one way or the other. And I also want to note that our obesity rates and our other chronic disease rates are particularly high in rural areas. And so when we see averages across Georgia for poverty or for some of our health outcomes, I think it's also important to note that um, Georgia, this county does not look the same as a county in South Georgia. And so there's a wonderful, I'm going to skip the diabetes, there's a wonderful uh, slide here that was developed by Partner, Partner Up for Public Health. This is Charlie Hayslett's group who does some work for the Georgia Public Health Association. And um, so to, to kind of explain, you really don't even need to know the details, just look at the colors. So red is bad, okay? And on the left side, it's looking at our tax credit rankings of 2011. And those rankings are based on unemployment rate, per capita income, and poverty rate. So if you, if you see a, a county that's red, that means they're, they're fairly low on the list uh, for tax credit rankings, and, and a green county is fairly high on the list. And if you contrast that colorful state with the, with the one on the right, that's showing what our health outcome rankings are. And again, red is bad and green is good. And, and this is looking at indicators such as life expectancy and low birth weight. And I think this is an incredible visual to show that there is not necessarily a causation between poverty and health status, but there's certainly a correlation going on in many of our counties. So the third, uh, the third reason why I think we, sh we have been, or the reason why I believe we've been talking about reforming our healthcare system, is our insufficient access to health insurance coverage. Um, this leads to system inefficiencies, as we heard from the last presenter, uh, people using emergency rooms as their primary care settings, um, and then leading to poor health outcomes as people um, don't go receive primary care, and uh, they just wait until their disease or illness gets worse enough that they have to show up in the emergency room. And this ends up in higher costs for all of us. And just to show you again where we stand in Georgia in terms of our uh, our public coverage and our uninsured, um, and again, the estimates that came out yesterday um, may make these data a little bit old. And again, this is why you have to be watching the news every single day to know what's going on in health policy. But the point being is that uninsured is 18% nationally, and here in Georgia, we're higher. And then thinking about that uninsured rate is probably even higher in those lower socioeconomic status uh, counties. Okay, so we've, uh, so we're talking about the Affordable Care Act today. Um, it was passed, as we've heard already, in March of 2010, and um, noteworthy is that it was passed with no bipartisan support. And so why was it passed with no bipartisan support? I don't understand that, because in the 2008 presidential election, health care reform was on the agenda for both candidates running for president. Um, and it has been on, uh, on the uh, campaign issue for all of the presidential elections that we've had um, in the last two decades, three decades, four decades. Um, but I would argue that the no bipartisan support is not because we don't recognize that there's a problem with our health care system. I think probably we do. It's just that the approaches we might take to change that system are very different. So you have one party that may focus more on um, reducing the number of uninsured in our country, while you have another party, political party, that may focus on um, reducing health care costs. And then if those are our two goals, we may have one party that looks towards uh, government-driven approaches for impacting those one or two goals, and then you have another party that's looking at market-driven approaches. And, and, I, and I would again argue, and I have argued, that in 2008 presidential election, uh, bef before the presidential election, that we were probably, as a country, somewhere right in the middle of that, of the, that quadrant, um, maybe on different sides, uh, in, different, in different parts there, but we were pretty close together. But we have seen, since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, um, that we have really moved to the opposite extremes. Um, so the theory behind the Affordable Care Act is that um, it builds on the current system that we already have, this system that has led us to high health care costs and poor health outcomes and no access to health insurance. And so to me, this is, um, 
This is a major failing of this health care reform, is that we have made a major policy change to a broken system. And unfortunately, this is the way policy is made in the United States. We tend to make incremental changes instead of full sweeping changes um, for lots of reasons that we could talk about um, as political theorists. Um, but So the current system is now modified slightly. And that means that this current system that we have, which is a public-private pri public um, provider, because we have the VA, which is public providing health insurance, and then we have private uh, hospitals and, and outpatient MDs providing health care, but then we have financing on the public and private as well. So Medicaid and Medicare is public financing, and then our employer-based health insurance is private. So we have this mixed system, and we have an expansion of that. So when I try to, when I have been trying to explain what's in the Affordable Care Act, because that's really step one over the last couple of years, I, you know, the 2,000 pages, there's many, many, many details, and depending upon who my audience is, I'll pull out what they might care about. So, for example, if I'm speaking to a public health audience, I will pull out the pieces that are specific to prevention, specific to evidence-based medicine, and specific to public health. Um, and then for businesses, obviously, we would want to talk about the, um, the carrots and sticks that are in place for um, employer, employers providing health insurance, which is where I'm going to spend the majority of my time. I'll also be talking a little bit about the individual mandate, although I think we heard a lot about that already. And I am not going to touch expansion of Medicaid with a 10-foot pole, because I, too, am trying to be nonpartisan, and I don't think that's why we're here today. And then the state-based health exchanges, I, I believe, our next speaker will be talking about. So let's talk about the individual mandate first. Um, the individual mandate basically says, as you are well aware, that all Americans uh, must carry health insurance with some exceptions beginning in 2014. And we did hear um, the last speaker talk about um, what these penalties mean. There was lots of discussion in 2009 by economists that were part of the um, policy, the policy development process on how high do you make that penalty such that people will, act, will actually change behavior because that is why you have this piece of the legislation. And frankly, they had to come up with, um, they had to negotiate this penalty down. So if, as, as a health economist, I would argue that the penalties are too low and that most people will not change behavior and go out and seek uh, uh, health insurance. Those young invincibles, I don't see them doing it. That's my, my opinion. Um, Generous subsidies from the federal government uh, for those who qualify. Um, the, one of the benefits here of, of having an insure, um, employer, an individual mandate is it establishes minimum coverage levels um, for the first time. It was upheld by the Supreme Court um, last summer, I guess, or was it this summer? I'm, I'm all mixing together for me, um, as a tax. And really one of the main reasons why this individual mandate is, is extremely important as the whole of Affordable Care Act has been passed, is that it balances out this no denying health insurance to people with pre-existing conditions. Um, if, if it's the case that health insurance um, companies now have to cover people with pre-existing conditions, then they will be better served to increase their risk pool. And we can do that by requiring everybody to have health insurance. So this was a very important piece to be included. Um, the rationale for the individual mandate is it's trying to achieve near universal coverage of health insurance. So again, thinking about what the two goals of the Affordable Care Act are or might have been, uh, which is to reduce the number of uninsured and to um, decrease rising health care costs. This is really hitting at the uninsured piece. Um, and it prevents healthy people from waiting until sick to purchase insurance. Um, so, that, uh, so that is also a major component and a major benefit of the individual mandate. So I'm going to turn my attention now to the, what's happening on the employer-based health insurance side. And I have uh, a, a couple things to talk about on the carrot side, which are the, what are the incentives. And you see, um, sorry for my stupid graphics, but this is what, this is what, what I have. Um, so there are small carrots and there are big carrots. Um, and then there are small sticks or penalties and then there are big sticks and penalties. Um, so let's talk about the carrot. So the small carrot that is available to employers to try to encourage you to provide health insurance to your employees, employees is uh, grants available for employee wellness programs. So the Affordable Care Act spends a lot of time in defining what, we, what they mean by wellness programs. Um, they define wellness programs as either participatory or comprehensive. And a 
a participatory wellness program is something like um, providing uh, uh, premium reductions for health education seminars, providing free seminars, uh, providing time away from the office to go to health seminars, maybe something like this. Um, we just started um, a Tai Chi class on our health sciences campus at the University of Georgia. It's completely voluntary. Uh, we, hope 20, we hope to see 25 people there every time. That's very much of a participatory wellness program. In contrast, the comprehensive wellness program is, and if you focus on that last bullet, is really designed to have a comprehensive program for your employees that rewards them based on some measurable improvement in either health status, such as a BMI screening, or in uh, reducing health risk behavior, such as reducing tobacco usage. Um, so it's a very different, more, uh, more comprehensive program. And the key here is that the grants that are available to small businesses are only for those comprehensive programs, not for the participatory programs. So beginning in January, there will be about $200 million available for small businesses. It's important to clarify what we mean when we say the word small business because the Affordable Care Act chooses many different def definitions depending upon what part you're reading. So in this part, they are defining small business as less than 100 employees. Uh, to be eligible, this has to be a new program that was put in place since 2010. And again, as I said before, it's only available for comprehensive wellness programs. Um, Okay, now I, we, my research, uh, my research uh, assistants and I try to find if there's anything out there yet in terms of when you can submit proposals for the wellness programs and um, that is yet to be determined. So stay tuned, we're a little bit behind. So the other, the other um, carrot, so this is the large carrot, is the small business healthcare tax credit. So the eligibility rules here are that employers must cover at least 50% of the cost of health insurance um, for some of its workers. And here they're defining small businesses differently than in the last uh, slide. And here it's less than 25 full-time workers. And the workers must have an average annual wage of less than $50,000. $50, and for-profit and tax-exempt firms um, qualify, although there's different requirements uh, depending upon whether you're for-profit or not. Um, and then there's some ramp up phases here as well. So by 2014, so this started in 2010, but by 2014, the maximum tax credit is about 50%. And according to the Lewin Group, there's about 84% of businesses in Georgia that would qualify for some or part of the credit uh, beginning in 2010. And so I thought it would be interesting to find out how many businesses are actually um, taking advantage of this. And I, while I couldn't find Georgia data, I was at least able to find some information nationally. So nationally, um, 1.4 to 4 million businesses should be able to qualify for this tax credit, yet only 170,000 of them have actually claimed any credit. And so this, to me, is an implementation failure that it could be that businesses are not aware of the um, tax credit, it might not be worth it to them to do a comprehensive program, and so it will really take some health, good health policy analysts to figure out what's going on here. Um, so now I'm gonna switch over to the sticks. Um, and if, you're, if you see this little cartoon here, we've got Obamacare on the table, and uh, employer mandate looks, looks like the heart there, potentially, um, and we're just gonna wait on that because um, there's still some kinks to be worked out on how to deal with this employer mandate. So the mandate, uh, so the mandate says that employers with more than 50 full-time employees, so again, thinking about what is small versus large here, must provide health insurance, else face a penalty. And so the small stick is the penalty for those, uh, for those employers, large employers, who offer health insurance, but it's unaffordable to some of their employees. And those employees end up having to seek out federal subsidies to purchase health insurance. In that case, they get, the employer is faced with a $3,000 penalty per employee who has to go out and seek the federal subsidy. In contrast is the large stick, which is for those employers who have more than 50 employees who do not provide health insurance, they face a penalty of $2,000 per every single employee that they have beyond the first 30 that are excluded. So when businesses, particularly large businesses, are thinking about what is the penalty that they have to face uh, versus provision of health insurance, I think the large stick is going to play a major role. 
uh, originally scheduled for 2014, but as you know, this is delayed until 2015. And then there's other employer requirements um, in, in the legislation as well, such as pr uh, minimal essential requirements for health care insurance, um, including prevention and wellness services and ho hospitalization. Um, and then if you go to the U.S. Chamber, I don't know how many of you have downloaded this document and reviewed it. I've looked at it over several times. And one uh, phrase really really hit home with me, and, and it's this one. The basic premise of the law fundamentally shifts the foundation of employer-sponsored benefits in America. What has been a voluntary and flexible system will now be a one-size-fits-some landscape. And so just to remind us on how we came up with employer-based health insurance in the first place, we are the only country, as far as I can tell, uh, in the industrialized world other than Germany that has employer-based health insurance. And in our country, it came about during World War II when there were wage and price gaps, uh, caps put in place. Um, and so in, at the same time, we were ramping up production in factories because of the war. And so employers really needed to have a way to compete in the labor market. And one way they competed was to provide generous benefits, including um, life, life insurance and also, um, and also health insurance. And so we still have the system today, and one of the reasons why we do is there's also a tax break afforded to employers who offer health insurance. Um, and that was established with IRS rules in the late 40s and early 50s. And the point being that the Chamber is making is that where once health insurance may have been considered a voluntary benefit, we are now seeing with the Affordable Care Act that it is a mandated benefit, and that is a very different kind of system. So, with health reform bringing new cost pressures, employers are now trying to figure out ways of managing their costs. And I guess I would argue that their costs were there, uh, regardless of the Affordable Care Act being passed in 2010, um, but I think that um, a lot of the uh, press that we're hearing on large employers is a reaction to the Affordable Care Act, but also a reaction to their rising health care costs in the first place. So, the, the um, tactics that employers are taking really depends on who in their population they are thinking about. So if you think about the risk continuum um, of your employed population, you have probably 85% or so of your employees who are relatively healthy and who are only consuming about 15% of your total health care expenditures. And for these employees, large employers are really trying to target health promotion and health risk management. So this is looking at health risk assessments, um, providing incentives to conduct an annual health risk assessment or biometric mar mar uh, markers such as a BMI, such as glucose screening. Some employers are, are now putting in penalties for employees who choose not to do the health risk assessments. Um, but how many of them are doing these wellness programs? About 50% of all U.S. Uh, employers have a wellness program, but I would argue that most of, the, most of those are participatory and not comprehensive. Um, the focus is on weight and smoking, fitness, alcohol, and stress. Um, 40, there's been some evidence to show that 46% of employees actually participate in these programs. I don't believe it. Um, I believe the other statistic more so, which is that, <laughs> uh, that 15% probably are participating in the more uh, rigorous, comprehensive programs that are, are all around disease management. Um, but that 46 participation is, I just, it's hard for me to believe. But then this last bullet also says there's evidence that the, there is statistically significant improvements in some of um, these health behaviors for employees who do participate in the wellness programs. The problem with wellness programs is you're not getting the 85%, the 15% unhealthy, you're getting the 85% healthy participating in those wellness programs. Um, so let's take a look at what's happening with employers around um, the country right now when it comes to this biometric screening. So this was in the news in the last um, month or so that CVS is now requiring all of its employees to submit to a weight, body fat, glucose, and other vitals test by May 2014. Um, and if they don't do it, then they face a $50 a month charge on health insurance, increase in their health insurance. There have been some CVS employees who have challenged this in court and lost. Um, CVS has stated that the benefits program evolving to help our colleagues take more responsibility for improving health and managing health-associated costs. And so this idea that um, we as employees 
can no longer just go and use any health uh, care that we want because our employer-based health insurance is going to cover it is going away. And there's going to be, in my opinion, more transparency in how much our health expenditures really are from a consumer standpoint and that we will be required to take on more responsibility as an individual. Penn State is the most recent one to make the news. Um, I sit on the advisory board for the Board of Regents here in Georgia, and so we're watching very closely what our competitor um, academic institutions are doing. So Penn State um, instituted the Take Care of Your Health, and as the New York Times reported, in the dead of summer when no faculty were around to complain. Um, <laughs> and, and so this Take Care of Your Health requires employees to undergo biometric tests and complete a health risk assessment, which asks some pretty um, invasive questions, at least according to the faculty who were um, providing quotes for the New York Times article, about your medical history, about what are your finances, about your marital status, and about your job-related stress. Um, and here's some nice quotes that came from this article that was on September 14th. Um, so, uh, because I'm a, uh, I do policy analysis um, research, one of the things I'm very interested in is not setting policy for policy's sake, but actually um, setting policy that has an evidence base behind it. Um, we think about this in clinical medicine as well. You want your physician to, um, to give you the right drug because there's a clinical trial that says it's the right drug. Well, it's the same thing in policy. I would hope that policies get passed where someone's actually done research on the implications of those policies. I know I live in a... I live in a world that doesn't exist, but whatever. Um, so, so here's the uh, returns on investment of wellness program. So returns on investment is basically doing a cost-benefit analysis. How much are employers having to pay for the wellness program, and how much do they get in returns in terms of reduced medical care costs for their employees, and then also increased productivity, because presumably if we're all happy and healthy, we'll also be more productive. Uh, so there's um, some very important articles that have come out in the last couple of years. 2010, saying there, uh, 2010 article is basically saying there is a positive returns on investment in these employee wellness programs. Chapman in 2012 also said there's returns on investment. But, aha, the RAND study, which is really the best conducted of all three of these, just released in the last couple of weeks um, a very large meta-analysis that said there's no statistically significant savings in a five-year period for employers who are putting in a wellness program. Um, so then we've got this other 15% of the employee base who's in, in, incurring 85% of your costs, and the goal here is really to do um, disease management. So you've kind of identified or targeted your employees who have one of the major uh, chronic diseases, and you do something around um, disease management or case management. Um, the targets are congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, diabetes, asthma, etc., um, here's another statistic that 77% of large firms and 57% of small firms have at least one or more of the above. Again, I totally don't believe that statistic. Um, you know, at the, at the Board of Regents and having a family member with a chronic disease, I can tell you our disease management is nothing more than a nurse calling once a year. And that's not an effective disease management program. Um, so what does the evidence say on returns on investment in chronic disease management? Getzel, Ron Getzel is really the leading um, researcher in this area. He's got a, an appointment at Emory, in fact, um, and he has produced um, several articles that have claimed a returns on investment for some disease management programs. So you can see asthma, there is a return, um, but look at diabetes, there's not a, a return on investment with the diabetes management programs. Um, so then let's talk about other major trends that are going on, and this is the consumer, this is getting consumers or employees more involved in, in, in their care and in, in what kinds of services they receive. And so we see this big push for consumer-driven health plans. And this is essentially looking at um, a health insurance plan where you have a higher, typically higher than nor normal, whatever normal is, uh, higher than normal deductible, probably relative to a um, preferred provider organization type of plan. And it's also offered with some type of health savings account. And there's many different names that we use for those types of accounts. But it's essentially where the employee puts money into an account that they can draw from for out-of-pocket expenditures and for other things that are, are, are allowed. And sometimes employers seed that pot of money or match that pot of money, but not always. Um, but it's becoming more and more frequent that, um, that employers are now 
having this as one of their only plans available to their employees, or having this as the default plan when they, um, when they are hired. Um, and so let's look at some other trends. Um, I just love, the news is a wonderful place to get your information. So University of Virginia has also um, hit, hit the news recently because they have decided to drop spousal coverage, probably also passed in the dead of summer when new faculty were around. Um, so the idea here is that spouses with health insurance coverage that's available to them under their own employment uh, will no longer be covered um, under the UVA plan. UPS um, has also decided to drop the spouses, citing increased costs. And then in some other companies, they're starting, not, they're not dropping spouses, but they're, um, they're using surcharges uh, when a spouse could have gotten employer-based health insurance at their own company. And so Penn State, you know, again, another uh, wonderful thing that Penn State's doing is charging, in addition to their biometric screening, is charging $100 per month um, for the spouse. We also see health insurance vouchers uh, becoming the new trend. Uh, so IBM has reported that in January of next year, they will be granting retirees um, a voucher that they can then go into a Medicare exchange and purchase whatever they want. Um, I will tell you that, but if there's a reporter in the room, please don't put it in the newspaper, that the Board of Regents is also thinking about how to deal with, medic with our retired population because they are in that 15% of your employed population that's incurring 85% of the costs. Um, and so a voucher system is, is something that we're looking at pretty closely. DuPont and Caterpillar um, have done the same thing. Sears has actually moved all of their employees or will be moving all of their employees over to a voucher system. Um, and Trader Joe's, um, while they may have covered part-time employees in the past, will no longer be covering part-time employees and instead be giving them a voucher for, to help them uh, to look for health insurance on the market. And then other changes, let's see, raising the eligibility requirements for benefits. So Wegmans uh, went, raised their eligibility from 20 hours a week to 30 hours a week, cutting employee hours to under 30 hours a week, so forever 21, uh, cut all their line workers to 29.5 hours. Hours. And so this is probably for those of you who are small business owners with rate, and when you're right at that 50 FTE cutoff, probably um, a lot of decision making is going on around full time versus part time employees. So the key considerations I think that businesses should be considering right now are the following. That what is your mix of full and part-time employees? And as I said, is there ways that, this, that you can adjust employee status? And, and I think in the long run, this is going to be really bad for our economy. Um, if it's the case that um, people have to cobble together more than one job, and, and that, that I don't think is going to serve that family well, nor is it going to serve the economy well. That won't show up in our um, unemployment rate. Um, and, 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 and also, if they're not able to cobble together more than one job and they're working under the, under the 30 hours per week, then you have the case that people are employed, but they're underemployed. And that's also a statistic that we have a hard time really understanding uh, with the data available. And then if you provide coverage today, how does the cost of that coverage compare to your total penalty exposure? Um, so it may be less expensive to pay the penalty. And I think we'll, um, you know, I think the comment that was made earlier that the number of employers offering health insurance is going down. And I believe that the Congressional Budget Office, when they were pricing out the Affordable Care Act, also predicted that the employer-based health insurance um, would go down. But I guess I would argue that that's part of our health care system that maybe we should reconsider because it's been here since World War II and it doesn't seem to be getting us anywhere. And then are you in an industry where there is not a lot of competition for highly skilled employees? So one of the reasons why those benefits have been provided to us in a flexible, voluntary way for all these years is because people were trying to compete for highly skilled workers. But if you don't have that competition in, in some of your um, businesses and we have a high unemployment rate, then offering health insurance is, may not even be an issue for you. Um, and I want to end with my favorite slide. And I think this slide, um, I don't know if there's a date on this, but, um, but honestly, I think I'll be using this slide 10 years from now. <laughs> and um, that's it. Thank you for your attention.